Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at this example asking us to find a limit of a vector valued function. And I've written up here at the top a theorem that we looked at in a previous video. Uh, this is an if and only if theorem, so a pretty powerful theorem because the implication goes both ways. Uh, and it says that the limit of a vector valued function is a vector, an actual vector, if and only if the limits of the component functions all exist and are the components of this vector that we're interested in here. Uh, okay, so we're supposed to find the limit of this vector valued function. So what this theorem tells us is that uh, rather than having to think about the limit of the whole vector valued function, in a lot of ways we can think about the limit of those individual component functions. So this becomes a problem sort of like you might have seen in calculus one or two, uh, where you're working with limits of single variable functions. Um, okay, so we're gonna be looking at the limit as t approaches one of each of these component functions. Before we really do that though, it may be worth it, it's always worth it to think about uh, the original function and think about the domain of the original function. Limit is not explicitly about domain, but it's related to domain. So let's just take a moment before we dig into the limits here and think about the domain of this function. Uh, the first component function is gonna require that t is greater than or equal to zero. t is greater than or equal to zero for this one because of the square root. Uh, the second component function has two things to think about with it. We've got a denominator that is sometimes zero, so t could not be one or negative one. And the logarithm function also has some restriction. That's gonna force t to be greater than zero. So I'm just writing down some kind of scratch work, thinking about the restrictions from the different pieces that I see here. Uh, and then the arc sine function or the inverse sine function, that's one students always tend to have a difficult time with. If we think about uh, the restrictions about that, our t values are gonna have to be between negative one and positive one. Okay, so if I put all of these things together, uh, one of the things that you might notice is that this function, if we think about the domain of this function, so putting all of these restrictions together, we really only get an interval from zero to one, not including one, right? t greater than zero, uh, already agrees with this, but excludes the t equals zero. Uh, t cannot equal plus or minus one, so the minus part is already restricted by t greater than zero. And then this forces t to be between negative one and one. So if I put all of that together, we can see that the domain of this function really only is from zero to one. So technically, this limit, as it's written, we can't actually find because the domain uh, doesn't exist on the other side of one. And when we talk about a limit like this, remember that if it's not talking about one side or the other, then it really would be talking about just the limit uh, from both sides. So if it's not establishing one side or the other. So really the only way we can answer this question uh, is to think about a limit from the left. This function's only defined on the left side of t equals one. So let's just consider instead of the limit as t equals one, as t approaches one, the limit as t approaches one from the left. So I put the minus sign up there to think about that. Okay, so then uh, this theorem though tells us we can then consider limits of each of these three component functions. So the limit as t approaches one from the left of square root of t. So I'm gonna consider that first. Um, so the square root function uh, is well behaved around t equals one. This is a limit where you can actually use a substitution shortcut to think about this limit. So this limit will just be square root of one, which is one for this first limit. Uh, our second component function Uh, so if I try to think about using substitution in that one, you run into some trouble. Uh, natural log of one is zero, and one squared minus one is zero. So that is a zero over zero indeterminate form. Um, so you can't just use substitution to find that limit. You do have some tools available from prior calculus 
classes though that uh, help you evaluate limits that are that zero over zero indeterminate form. So L'Hopital's rule is the appropriate, uh, what I would use to figure this out. So I'm gonna just use LHR to indicate that I'm using L'Hopital's rule here. Hopefully that's not too far gone in your memory. All right, so L'Hopital's rule says that if you have an indeterminate form, zero over zero or infinity over infinity, that the limit of this ratio of functions is equal to, provided the limit exists, the limit of the ratio of their derivatives. So uh, derivative of ln t is one over t, and derivative of t squared minus one is two t. And I'm gonna just clean that up. One over t divided by two t is one over two t squared. Just simplifying that with the algebra here. And then this is a limit where I can just use substitution to finish this limit. So this would be one over two times one squared. Remember that limits are not really about substitution, but sometimes you can do that as a shortcut if your function uh, meets the criteria for the theorems that you have about that substitution shortcut theorem. Valid here. Uh, all right, so we get one half. All right, so uh, what I've done here is check the limits of the first two component functions and I got some values, so our L1 would be one and our L2 would be one half. And then I need to consider the limit of this last component function, the limit as t approaches one from the left of arc sine of t. And uh, so we can actually use substitution on that one as well. So that's arc sine of one. So that's asking us for the angle in the appropriate interval, negative pi over two to pi over two, that has a sine value of one. So that's pi over two. All right, so that's our L3. So I'm using this theorem. I was interested in this limit of this vector valued function. This theorem tells me if I can find limits of my three component functions, then the limit of those three component functions gives me the components in my answer here. So the limit that we were interested in at the beginning of the problem, I'm just gonna put here equals, this limit is equal to uh, one, one half, pi over two. Okay, so the intent here was really to find a limit of a vector valued function, but embedded in that, notice we did a little review of some limits from some prior classes. You might find that you need a little more review than I just did right here. So look that stuff up, go watch some videos on limits of functions from Calc 1 and 2 if necessary. You're gonna need them for some things that we do in this class beyond just this. So.